So welcome everybody to episode two of The Liberal Arts Can Save the World. Uh, this is a show where we talk to PLU staff and faculty about the things they're passionate about and how those things matter in the world. Today, uh, uh, today, today, I am starting over. No, it is today, just keep going. <laughs> it is today. Today, my name is Kevin O'Brien. I am the Dean of Humanities and I use he, him pronouns. And um, I am joined by the amazing co-host uh, who encourages me to keep going, uh, Angie Hambrick. Mm -hmm. Angie is the Assistant Vice President for Diversity, Justice, and Sustainability, an expert in social justice and higher education, and also the co-host of Diversity Deep Dive, which is the show you should all be watching every Thursday. They already are, but thanks for I'm that. I'm sure they are, yeah. if they are wise. <laughs> uh, Angie, to get in the liberal arts mood, I'm going to ask you a liberal artsy question. Okay. What's, uh, um, what's a book or a class from your own college career that you find yourself still remembering, still thinking about? Sure. So I immediately went to my history class, History 444, oh, which was a civil rights class and tactics mm -hmm. of the civil rights. It was taught by Dr. Salika Duxworth Lawton. She is the only Black American faculty member that I've ever had in all of my 20 something years in school. Um, and the book that she gave us to read was called Ooh. Still Have It. It has a little post it note from all those years ago, it was Negroes with Guns. Uh -huh. um, and it's basically a book about, it's a story about uh, these folks in North Carolina. Um, who decided to arm themselves um, against the Klan because the Klan was like riding on their town. I think the town was Monroe. They were riding in on their town. One of the guys um, had just got back from, from a war and he was in the military and he was thinking about armed self-resistance. And so they armed the town and they pushed the Klan back. And I remember it being so impactful because, you know, when we learn about the civil rights movement, we're kind of taught kind of the single story of mm -hmm. um, civil disobedience, nonviolence, that's the only way, that's the most effective way, it's the only way to get things done. Um, and this, this book like turned all, all that on its head to say, mm, you know what, sometimes a gun might be the best way to not only protect your body, like physically protect your body, but also to um, make a statement about the importance of our lives. And so um, this book, along with Salika being the only professor, Black, Black American professor that I ever had, like, I still think about Negroes with guns. I see her on Facebook all the time. I say, Negroes with guns. She's like, yep, we're <laughs> 44. <laughs> yep. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new greeting, but I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm no, just that's... Like, screaming that sometimes on on <laughs> you think Negroes with guns or history. I don't know about screaming Negroes with guns. Maybe, but definitely yeah. forty four. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's super powerful, and I mean, obviously, so relevant to now. But and and I want to. I, we will talk more about that. But also, just this example of a class that showed you that like one story is never true. Like the world is always more complicated than, uh, than the sort of stories we've inherited or what we've learned before. And there's always these other sides and these other complexities and, uh, and in a struggle for justice, there's always all these streams coming together. So yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Angie. Sure, of course. And uh, Angie and I are joined today uh, by our faculty expert, Dr. Catherine Wiley, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology, uh, Dr. Wiley, and also the, um, the director, I should say, of the Peace Corps Prep Program. Uh, Dr. Wiley teaches courses on uh, human diversity, on the anthropology of Africa, in global studies, in gender, gender sexuality, and race studies, and um, is all around awesome. And uh, your job, your first job is probably the hardest, Kat, uh, in like one breath, one sentence. Can you describe what it is you're an expert in, what you teach? What I teach? Um, yeah, so anthropology is interested in the diversity of human life, and I'm a cultural anthropologist, so generally what that means is the diversity of human life today and the way people live. And uh, my courses uh, cover everything from clothing, the kinds of clothing we wear, to religion. I have a course that I teach on Islam and particularly women's experiences in the faith, to um, a general course, an intro 
doctoral course where we talk about everything from cell phone use in Nigeria and how that might look different in the United States to bride, kid making, bride kidnapping in Kyrgyzstan to the American family and how it's organized and has changed over the last 50 years. So if people are doing it today, anthropologists are probably studying it. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to focus our, our attention on Anthropology Day, uh, Kat has suggested that we talk about the Netflix show Dating Around, which I'm so excited to talk about. Uh, let me give a really brief introduction just in case uh, some of our viewers uh, don't have time to pause and go to their Netflix account and just watch a couple of episodes of Dating Around. Uh, you Dating all Around should. Show. Yeah, you all should. And we'll be here. Uh, we'll wait. Uh, Dating Around is a, is a reality show that follows one person, either in New Orleans or New York in the first two seasons, uh, who goes on five blind dates and then chooses one person to go on a second date with. Um, and uh, one of the things I think is really fascinating about it is while other reality shows, you know, promise a quick marriage or do these in-depth interviews to try and get people to say outrageous things, this show just watches people go on a date. And so it provides this really interesting I'm really curious if it's realistic uh, view of life in a couple of uh, urban centers in the U.S. So, uh, Angie, did you get a chance to watch an episode or two? I watched one episode. I watched the episode that uh, you and Catherine told me I should watch, which was Diva. Mm -hmm. which was really good. I have all kind of thoughts and feelings about it. So. Yes, cool. yes. <laughs> we will talk. Uh, but, but Kat, first, uh, talk to us a little bit about how does... How does being a cultural anthropologist influence the way you watch this show and how can this show help us think about the work of a cultural anthropologist? Yeah, so I've been really obsessed with this show this summer um, and kind of surprisingly so because I feel like I haven't been able to binge watch as much as normal in the pandemic and with the George Floyd killings. I, somehow my brain hasn't gone there, but I binge watch this. And I've been thinking a lot about why and I think it is partly because I'm a cultural anthropologist. And so when you watch this show, there are no interviews with the people who are dating. It makes you feel like you are just on their dates and it kind of flashes back and forth between the different dates. And the, the main dater who they call the lead dater wears the same outfit for the five dates. So you even almost, they kind of blur together. And cultural anthropologists, the major method we use, so the main way we like collect information in our research is called participant observation. And that what that means is kind of embedded in those terms but it's basically like if you we uh, we sort of believe if you want to understand human life you have to live it alongside people so you have to spend time with them doing what they're doing and learning about it as it happens and maybe asking questions along the way so we do also do interviews and study historical documents and things like that but, but participant observation is the main way we collect information and so to me as an anthropologist it kind of feels like you're doing that when you watch the show. It feels like you're just there observing these dates as they unfold. Um, so I think that that's really interesting. I also think it's interesting though, because one of the problems with participant observation is you're there. Right. So there's always this weird anthropologist around, um, which obviously changes what's happening. And so I also think it's interesting to watch the show because there's obviously a camera crew and lighting and so even though it appears very realistic the participants are really aware of mm -hmm. um the fact that they're going to be on netflix and we right. all are going to be talking about them in a podcast so i think it captures some interesting aspects of anthropology which is one of the reasons it appealed to me as a show yeah oh, that's cool and so so what do you think like um you've watched all the show and just watched an episode i'm about eight in i got i got a few left i'm excited probably yeah. tonight did you, start um, first, did you start with the first season and you're just going all no i uh netflix started me at the second season and so i was in new orleans and then the last two i was it was the shock to the system to be in new york um <laughs> and and i have i am not an anthropologist by any means but like i'm starting to have these theories about how the culture of dating is really different in new orleans versus new mm. york and like that's one of the stories i'm telling Telling from it, yeah. But but what do y'all see? Like, what are, what do we learn about the diversity of human life among uh, dating millennials in U.S. cities from this show? Um, do you want to start, Angie, or should okay. I? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so. I mean, I guess one thing I like about the show, and of course it's highly edited, right? So they're choosing like what they put in because you really see probably four minutes of each of the five dates, right? When they actually film them, they said it usually takes five hours to film. Oh my Lord. 
So they're very selectively choosing. They're um, going on five hour dates? Yeah, because they have to change the cameras in between the different like drinks to the main course to, yeah, five hour dates. Bless um, them, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, so I do, one thing I like about it and how they portray it, which I think is different than other reality shows, and I don't know if this actively actually captures what happens on the dates, but I think they show, they have a real diversity of um, races and genders and sexualities, maybe not mm -hmm. gender as much, but definitely like race and sexuality um, in the show. And I think they show, they, and again, it might not be true, but that people are being sort of really open to each other generally and kind of listening to each other and um, just being kind, uh, which I think is very different from a lot of reality shows that are like yeah. stirring it up and just trying to create a lot of drama. And we can talk more about the diva episode because that I think that's interesting partly because of what happened. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I do, I think part of maybe why I liked it this summer was it made me feel a little hopeful about how we can like talk to each other and learn from each other. Um, when we're in the midst of just like this really uh, tense political situation mm -hmm. and um, yeah, where there feels like there's just so much conflict and, and people can't even listen. Um, and so that was something I think drew me to it this particular summer. I don't know if it, <clears throat> excuse me, happens in every episode because I just watched the one, but in the Diva episode, I assume that it was her sister kind of gave some background of who yeah. she was and why she hasn't dated and just the kind of person that she is. And so um, it kind of set me up to think that I knew Diva well yeah. enough to know which person that she might choose or which person she was going to have the most connection with. Mm -hmm. or, like I was really rooting for her to find love, I guess, mm -hmm. or yeah. to find a connection or to find someone that she was gonna want to have a, a second date with, so it mm -hmm. it very much um, kind of almost put me not in her shoes, but it it aligned me with her a little bit more and um, made her seem like it was she was someone that I was rooting for. Mm -hmm. Like I, I want her to to make it. I want her to find whatever it is that she's looking for. Yeah. So very much um, made me connect with her. Mm -hmm. And I, are all the episodes like that? Do they kind of set you up? that way yeah they also set you up yeah and almost i think all the people they feature for the most part are like diva and that they're interesting and they seem mm -hmm. kind of kind and so yeah you're not like oh i hate there are right. a couple <laughs> who are somewhat cringeworthy <laughs> but in general you are yeah i agree you're rooting for them and i also think most of us have gone on dates i don't know about you two i find dates terrible well, or often right and i think that <laughs> That for me also met, made me feel things with them along, right? When there's an awkward moment or someone says something just totally terrible or, or that connection, like the spark, right? And finding joy with another person and, yeah. and so on. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about that though, because I do, I, I do think you're right. One of the things that really contrasts this with other reality shows, I've only seen one or two walking through the room, of course, complete lie. Uh, I've watched a lot of reality TV and most of it like sets me up to feel better than the people I'm watching. Like I have this sense of, wow, they're a mess. I must be so together. And this show yeah. very much puts you like right there with them and says like, you're, yeah. you have something in common, you're rooting for this person. But I think like the habit that I had to get myself out of while watching is trying to figure out which of the people that they're dating I liked best. Yeah. Like which one I would want to go on a second date with. Yeah. And like, and I, I just feel like the show is teaching me to be like, no, it's not about me. It's who would Diva want to go on a date with. Mm -hmm. And that feels like a sort of anthropological imagination move, right? That like to study yeah. other people is to try to study other people, not to project myself onto them. Yeah, and I like, feel like the show really invites you to do that. Does that sound right? Absolutely. Like putting yourself in someone else's shoes and trying mm -hmm. to understand their perspectives. That's definitely something anthropology would push for. I think what's also interesting though, because I did a lot of, of research on this show, which was very fun. <laughs> and one thing the producer said was they, before they filmed, they almost always like took bets on who the person would get, uh, like choose, uh -huh. and they were almost always wrong. And so I think that's interesting too, because I found myself doing the same thing, both like who would I date and who do I think this person would date? And sometimes I was right. Like I thought the diva episode was pretty clear who she was mm -hmm. gonna pick, but, a lot of times I was wrong. And then it's really interesting to think like, why do people do the things they do? And why do they make the choices they make? And I think the show 
uh, was also anthropological because it didn't just interview someone at the end and have them tell you. Um, and a lot of times in life, people don't, we don't know why people do the things they do. And I thought that was very real and true to life. And even if someone told you, they might not be really meaning it or they might mm -hmm. not understand well, I, like sometimes you go on a date and you're like, I, I, and I'm married, so I don't really date anymore. But I remember, right? Like you go, really. date, you go on a date and you're like, I shouldn't like this person, but I do somehow, right? Yeah. So yeah, it also, I can, yeah. Hey, I'm going to stumble over the word, but another anthropological, oh, I did it. Anthropological <laughs> thing that I was thinking about was the end. Um, where Diva chooses, you know, who, the person that she wants to go on a second date with. And I, and they kind of ride off on their bikes on a nice day. And I thought to myself, and I went to the, the episode screen, I'm like, oh, I wonder do they follow up with them later to see like, are they still together? Did they have another date? Like, is there kind of what we see in the reality TV with kind of the nice reunion show? Mm -hmm. So I was like, I really wanted to know. And then you know, I had to, had to step back and think and who I was going to be talking to today and think about how this is how life happens in research, right? Like you kind of get little glimpses into folks' lives as much as they want to, as much as they want you to. And then your study ends or something happens and then that's it. And then you don't know what happens after your observation time or your research study or that sort of thing. So, and people... Mm -hmm lives continue to move forward without being mm -hmm. kind of this voyeur into it. Yeah. yeah. And I think something else you said, Angie, that like, I like that you're saying like people letting you in as much as they want to. And that's so important, I think, with anthropology too, right? Because the people you work with are making strategic choices about mm -hmm. what they want to tell you. If, if they even want you to do that research, someone might say like, no, I'm not interested in that. And so it's like this, it's a relationship that's mm -hmm. built between um, the person doing the research and the person they're working with. So in, in the interest of getting us to the can save the world part of the title uh, we've been given for this show, I, I want to steer us back. You know, Kat, you mentioned that part of what's going on this summer is uh, everybody's reacting to the murder of George, George Floyd and a legacy of, of Black Lives Lost. And Angie, you've been thinking since college or before about Negroes with guns. And, uh, and the theme on the YouTube channel this week is, is Black Joy and Black Lives Matter. And so how does... Uh, show about people going on some dates on Netflix to help us think about, help us react to uh, the threats against Black lives, the, the diversity of Black lives, the importance of Black lives in the year 2020. Like what, how can we connect this show to that? We're both looking at each other. Um, Thoughtfully, we can all just take a moment and pause. <laughs> well, something you said, Kat, um, very early on about how there's so much going on, on in the world and you just haven't had time or almost felt like it was appropriate to indulge in something kind of silly, right? And I think um, the other part of, of the theme this week is Black Lives Matter, but also kind of Black joy and just finding, yeah. being able to find joy in things. And so um, not kind of forgetting about the, the moment in the movement that we're in and that black bodies are, are dying, are being murdered, are harmed, um, like still holding on to that, but still also finding ways to like, to find, to find joy and to be happy mm -hmm. and to indulge in things that might seem silly, but really give you life. And so mm -hmm. um, if you wanna watch this, if you wanna binge this Netflix show, that doesn't mean you're any less engaged or um, involved or paying attention to what's going on in the world. And I, and I think that um, sometimes when people want to see themselves as activists or allies or people are like really part of the struggle and the revolution, we kind of lose that part that there's joy in the revolution and also there's joy in the Netflix show, the trashy novel, um, mm -hmm. sitting outside in the sun, having a beer, like all of that is a part of, of life and living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I also was thinking about how race is depicted in this show. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the episodes people like definitely talk about um, how they identify racially. And there are some discussions about that with certain uh, of the people they go on dates with. But I also think it's 
it's depicting, it's not making race central. Um, and we can discuss right. if that's like problematic or not, but it, it's not. And so it's just showing lots of different people of lots of different racial backgrounds meeting. And then also showing like the joy when Diva, um, who is a woman of color, like meets this other woman um, and like they meet, they, as you said, like bike off into the sunset and- Spoiler well, alert, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry, <laughs> no, no, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I think just thinking about, I was like reading about Black Joy Matters and that kind of movement and saying it's not meaning like to erase the trauma of Black experiences, but it's also meaning to like show the joy of Black experience as well and, and a more well-rounded um, view of Black lives in the United States, which I think, again, sorry, is ties to anthropology because I think good anthropology tries to do that. It tries not to show a single story as you were talking about earlier, Angie, but like the complexity of life and the complexity of everybody's, I mean, we're not saying everybody, but the people's lives who you're working with. Yeah. yeah. Even how Diva was kind of um, portrayed in the beginning was she's kind of this weirdo. She doesn't really fit in. So she's a type of blackness that usually our imagination doesn't allow her to be. And then there's the one guy who's, he was weird, but the polyamory guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was, he was, he had a lot going on. Yeah. Um, but to, to think that, you know, oh, there, there are black folks who are in a polyamory. Well, well, duh. And so I think that part of what it did too was that show that there are different types of blackness. There's not one single type of how black people are black people. Um, the different guys, um, and, uh, diva who were in on the date. And so it just, it also paints a, a more, fuller picture of, of who we are as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I found myself really thinking a lot about what I wasn't seeing in the conversations because I do feel like they chose in the editing to show you some conversations about race. And I'm sure there were other conversations about race that they didn't show us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, so it, this is back to the sort of participant observer problem. Like mm -hmm. a, a story is being told to me about what it's like to date in an interracial context in the United mm -hmm. States now. And I'm sure there's other pieces to it, but this is like, this is reality. These people really did go on dates and like enjoy drinks and talk about whether they like to dance or not and uh, talked about whether they were um, open to polyamory or not. And uh, just to put the final plug in, if you don't watch any of the rest of the show, watch the Diva episode. Um, she's charming, she's interesting, and then she's just awesome in, in this one beautiful moment. So uh, yeah, worth watching. Uh, but it's, uh, as you say, Angie, as you say, Kat, like, these are Black lives living, right? And not Black lives just about an issue or just about an activist uh, activist purpose, although the, those things are hugely important. Also, Black lives like trying to find a partner or trying to have fun or enjoying a nice meal or, or anything else. And I think uh, to the extent this show gives us just a slice of real life, it's it's amazingly refreshing and also maybe like super empowering because people just seem more real and and themselves if you can get to know what they're like in the real world so yeah. so yeah yeah i also just think it's nice i i think so many of us and so many i'm sure students who might watch this we're on social media all the time and a lot of interaction occurs on social media and there's nothing wrong with that but i also found it refreshing just to see people meeting in person and talking and sharing drinks. And I think that was also shaped by COVID. And I've been thinking about this, right? We're in this moment when it's not really safe to go out and meet strangers. Mm -hmm. And so to think back to that world where we could do that and like what a privilege it is to go on a date or just go out with someone you think you might be friends with for coffee. And, and so I think mm -hmm. that's another reason why it really appealed to me in this particular yeah. moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to see all of those um, when you're in kind of the field, all those nuances that happen when you're in person that you can miss. So her eye rolls at that one guy were amazing. <laughs> and I aspire. <laughs> so like all, all yeah, those things cool. that when you're in, in observation that you look for, the, the eye rolls, the change and kind of body posture, um, the looking around, all that kind of thing, all those sorts of things that um, are really a part like make the observation so much more fuller because you get to see how people um, move around and, and, and act in space. And it's also interesting to see other people ignoring it, like her, her interaction with that man, like she's just sending all these signals and he's just not picking up on them and just continuing to be pretty sexist and all these sorts of things. So yeah, absolutely. 
I, uh, I, I'm an ethicist by training and the big debate in my household is between my partner and I about when these dates have gone wrong, is it right to say at the end, well, we didn't click or is it right to sort of let the person have hope? And that's what, uh, that's the decision I've watched like every time that some of them they'll say like, well, this is great, but clearly like one, one woman said, well, we are not soulmates and just sort of walked away and other people it's clear, well, maybe we'll talk again, but they don't. And, and that, um, that choice I think reveals so much yeah. in when they let someone go on and when they say, no, I'm going to tell you the truth and I'm going to make it clear to you that you should not expect a call. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and it's just another place where I'm sort of watching people's minds work in a cultural context, like watching people make decisions, which is, which is what's fun about the show. Yeah. yeah. And in moments that are awkward in a regular date, let alone a date <laughs> with like yeah. five video cameras and a huge right. crew around you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I think um, we've uh, we've concluded we all had fun watching this show, and that studying anthropology is just like watching this show at every Absolutely. moment, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take anthropology classes. Yeah. We'll talk. It's, we'll talk about just stuff. like Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we got uh, so Angie to wrap up. We gotta um, we gotta see if anthropology passes the test of will anthropology help save the world? So are we convinced? Like, is this um, is this meaningful? Is this important work? Um, and uh, the answer better be yes, or Kat's gonna feel awkward, so. I know, right, then what's the point of the show? <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> it does. I mean, the, the things that, you know, I appreciate about what Kat said about the field for me is really about observation. It's about um, people allowing you in, so you're not taking space that doesn't belong to you, but there's this relationship that you have with people or with groups that allows you to observe or be a part or, or whatever. Um, those things really, really are important to me and, and make sense and um, really are also a part of diversity and equity work. Like you have to be in relationship, you have to be in partnership, um, you have to be able to observe, um, you have to understand culture. So um, all these things make sense with the work that I do um, at PLU and kind of just how I live life as yeah. Angie. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, and I think I, that last part feels like super important to me that um, that studying diversity, advocating for diversity isn't something that just happens. Mm -hmm. Like to do anthropological participant observation, to advocate for diversity and equity, like you have to have a method and you have to carefully follow it. And I think that's that's something that, you know, maybe the difference between casually watching a show like this and really thinking about it shows you is like it matters what decisions were made to get you to a place to, to get a story told a certain way. And so it matters that anthropologists don't just sort of plop down in another culture and say, so tell me about yourself, but really think about the method and the power dynamics and, and every piece of it. So, so yeah, anthropology is awesome. I think that's, hey. I think that's clear. Thanks for saving the world, Catherine. Hey, yeah, thank you for saving the world, Andy and Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> No, this was awesome. Thank you both for taking the time to talk, uh, for taking the time to watch um, uh, and repeatedly plug Dating Around, um, which everybody go watch Diva if you don't watch anything else. Uh, thanks also to our producer, Kenzie, uh, to the uh, godfather of um, the YouTube channel, Lace Smith, uh, and to all of you for watching and for, um, for paying attention, for staying curious. Uh, hope everybody stays safe out there. Thanks. Bye. Bye.